Nothing wrong with the recording. Oh, there we go. All right, hello, welcome everyone to another community call. This one is a shorter one. We have only three topics for discussion, although one of them is a pretty lengthy one. So first of all, let's talk about the upcoming peer review feature and brainstorm, the ideas and features you would like to see. I have posted the link to the discussion thread. I'm going to post it again, that you might have seen before. We, where Kobe left a few notes about what are the topics we should potentially discuss. So just to give a brief picture of what is the process that they have in mind is essentially the ELN, the ELN function that's currently in development will be upgraded into the peer review function where people can choose to uh, assign DOI to the content that they created with their ELN. Then they can either select to make it a claim or, or a content, which a claim I'm guessing is something similar to what currently the hypothesis is and the content in you know, a post or, or, or an article. And so then peer reviewers will be assigned and that perhaps would be uh, a time for us to discuss the details of this procedure. What do you think is the best way to assign the uh, peer reviewers to, to, the, to the paper that's been reviewed? Should it be automatic? Should it be, uh, sh should the submitter have any say in it? Should it be someone from the hub? Should it be someone with the credentials, with reputation? What are your thoughts? Malik? Uh, uh, hi, guys. Um, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I was thinking uh, just a couple of things I wanted to throw out on that was, uh, A, uh, like at least somebody, um, you know, with credentials within Research Hub or outside Research Hub, um, and potentially if it is outside Research Hub, then they they join us, um, you know, in some way or form. If not as an editor, then um, you know, at, at least as a participant um, uh, who, who regularly participates. And um, second, um, um, you know, ideally, um, uh, you know, not have the the, uh, the, the the people who submit their papers select the reviewers because that's with the current system, right? Uh, where people, um, you know, for one reason or another, like you know, choose that oh, this is these are the three reviewers that we prefer, and which occasionally leads to a little bit of bias, um, um, you know. Uh, so so ideally, not the the people who submit who can select it. Uh, it should be random uh, from Research Hub um, and, and um, I, ideally anonymous uh, because that also uh, like protects the reviewer uh, from, you know, like somebody from a high standing at, I don't know, big university like Oxford or Harvard um, and not have to worry about the consequences of, uh, you know, like accepting or rejecting the article, um, you know, just, just, just my two cents. Yeah. Uh, so just to clarify that, so would you then see Research Hub and perhaps the editors themselves acting as you know current editors do? So they would uh, they would know the credentials and they would know the identity of who submits and who reviews, but they would withhold this uh, information from uh, you know the submitter and the reviewers, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that 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 can that can be done. Yeah, yeah, like just like present reviewers um, and um, you know um, then uh, uh, present editors. Yeah, exactly for journals uh, all across U.S. and elsewhere. Yeah. All right, sounds good. All right, Olga. Yeah, I guess it would be useful to know what purpose these reviews would serve because do we want Research Hub act as like journal? Do you want people? publish there and if we want people publish there how do we like how do we expect what are we going to do in order for people to just stop publishing in the journals and start publishing on research hub uh, and if it if it's not 
you know, something people do instead of publishing in journals? Do they publish on Research Hub before publishing in journal or after publishing in journal? Is our peer review is a step towards journal peer review? Do we do it in order for people to get feedback and then publish it in the journal, hopefully with better outcome? Or we do it with already published papers? Why? So I'm just trying to kind of navigate what what is the purpose really? All right, that's a, perhaps a question for all of us because we need to decide that. But the way I see it uh, is, it's my understanding that currently there will be no license restrictions that would prevent you from submitting the uh, your product somewhere else after being reviewed in Research Hub. So in this case, uh, if you are aiming for a high profile journal, you could use perhaps Research Hub as a as a place to get you know, preliminary review, right? For perhaps maybe for your preprint, or even if you have already finished the data collection, perhaps you're looking for input to improve the writing or the angle or something like that. And uh, perhaps that could be a first step before uh, Research Hub gains enough uh, popularity and reputation to be uh, you know, a, a goal to be published in by itself. In the early stages, perhaps it could be a set stepping stone into publishing in uh, a different journal. However, in the future, perhaps there could be a state where that's all that's all people want, just to get published in the research hub without getting it published anywhere else. And the, that's a good question. What would be the selling point for submitting to research hub and not anywhere else, right? So as it comes from the proposed structure, we are paying reviewers, which is a Good, good difference from almost any other um, uh, journal. However, what would be the benefits for the for the offers themselves? What do you yeah, think? also, also the review is a pretty painful process, right? Especially when people go back and forward a lot of times, and we are kind of asking people to do it twice on Research Hub first and this actual journal later. So the benefits should be pretty compelling in this situation, I feel like. That's a fair point. Um, I agree with Olga. Like, I don't see such innovation in reviewing nonstop. But um, I know that some organizations can fund only for peer review, especially for research. So maybe in the future we can receive some funding. Because, for example, we have a nice collection about medicine journals and cryptocurrency and so on. And maybe some, some institutions could be interested. Mm, interesting. So we could use uh, the resources we get that way to perhaps reimburse the offers themselves, so to give monetary rewards to offers submitting you know, the highest quality articles or something like that? Yes, this is another good idea. I was just thinking about attracting sponsors, but your idea is awesome like uh, rewarding the researchers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anton? I guess um, maybe another idea would be that, like, what kind of people would probably right now think about publishing on Research Hub? And I think probably it's more attractive to, like, young researchers than, like, senior researchers or people who are already used to their own pipelines. And I think, um, yeah, maybe also an, an interesting direction would be to kind of, yeah, attract or reward or kind of like offer a platform for students to do maybe their first papers or like blog posts. Because one question that I have is like, I don't know, I looked at the ELN and I try, I, I'm thinking myself of doing my research or things that I do through the ELN. Mm -hmm. But there's um, a bit of friction since it doesn't, it does feel like an extra load of work. So actually, even though 
I am an editor. I am not really 100% sure if I can like take all the energy to make the full research instead of like additional small blog posts, which are easier with the editing in Notion. So for instance, we use a lot mm -hmm. of LaTeX and Overleaf mm -hmm. and it just feels more fluent. So I think we should also discuss not only the incentives, but like how to, what, what features we use, right? For ELN. I feel like the ELN is pretty central, right? In the yeah, publishing. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. How, how do you feel about it? Like the ELN or po blog posting on it? Did, did someone try something with it? Right. I mean, per, you mean personal experience or insight into the development? Uh, both. I, I would be curious, like, if there's like experiences. Um, or uh, perhaps someone can share. Is anyone using ELN currently? A lot. Well, yeah, so perhaps, well, I'm, I'm guessing it's a work in progress, right? And so this functionality increasing from, from, you know, from stage to stage, perhaps it will get on par with, uh, you know, Notion editor or some other editor. But I think it's really interesting that you propose that we could focus on the population of younger researchers who don't have necessarily access or you know, data worthy of high profile journals, perhaps it could be interesting if we could uh, indeed make kind of like a low stakes seg segment of research hub where people could share uh, you know, maybe shorter uh, p pieces of papers and perhaps data that are not as, you know, uh, sparkly as the data they would publish in, in a high impact journal. Article, but that still would be, you know, interesting. Something they would go to the conference to viz, but not necessarily publish, right? I saw there was a hand, but I missed it. Oh uh, yeah, it was me. Oh, sadly. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Anton, I actually completely agree with that. Uh, so I think we had a, had the discussion a few weeks earlier in another community call uh, in which we were discussing how we can actually be a github uh, and young career people actually use github as a way to demonstrate their uh, coding language coding knowledge right uh, so mm -hmm. since we have a lot of people with great credentials already in the community uh, i think for somebody just starting out in their research career uh, it would be very beneficial if we could somehow demonstrate on their profile that uh, that this guy has worked with some other researchers from let's say john hopkins uh, and they have published something together i think that could be an if that could be a very interesting addition to someone's cv uh, and as somebody who's uh, just a bachelor right now i think i would be very interested in any service that offers that so like a more relaxed collaboration opportunity right very, very contribute right. but to, don't necessarily get into you know deep project for many years right yeah. right uh, and you can you mostly highlight the credentials of people you've worked with mm -hmm. one thing that we might want to figure out then is why would higher credential people want to work with uh, people who are just starting out right i think that might be a hindrance that, that possibly stops this mm -hmm. all right malik you're next yeah, and um, I, I like that idea too, um, like uh, what Anton and Satwick mentioned. Um, but one other incentive of why um, they would choose Research Hub would be this would be open access at no cost to them. You know, like right now people are paying thousands of dollars. I mean, I know some of you, I don't know if you saw what was on Twitter uh, that, um, you know, uh, physician Glaucoma Flecken uh had posted that somebody paid 11,000 euros or something for publishing in nature. So uh, one incentive we can say is like, hey, this is open access without cost. And um, our audience is like increasing, you know, day by day. So, um, you know, it's not like one of those um, predatory, uh, I, I don't like that word, but predatory open access journals, you know, where you have to pay a lot and then only you get open access so we have that benefit too yeah mm -hmm. so just to add before we move on with the predatory journals i think the expectation is 
for something to be called the predator journal is that particularly the peer review link right is is the weak one not necessarily the, the audience so mm -hmm. even if we had you know millions of people actively using the website we still need to make sure that not only the peer review process is uh uh, strict, but also is perceived as strict, right? So that, that yes. perhaps some publicity should be around that part. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Olga? Yeah, I have two points. Uh, first of all, I think we we can't talk about it as publishing open access because it's not actually publishing. You can't cite it. Your age index doesn't grow. You uh like don't go your your paper doesn't go on google scholar if you are publishing it on research hub etc 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 so if it doesn't function as actual scientific journal we can't like you know make it more attractive by saying that this is open access it's kind of like you know personal blog or website or something not not more than that currently but what I was thinking about in terms of trying and finding some kind of perks and benefits, uh, we can make it this uh, null results cemetery. So people who can't publish their null results in the actual journals because they're null results and they are very uh, often rejected. We can somehow either guarantee or have this like forward very tolerant policy towards null, null results saying that hey we publish everything you didn't find mm -hmm. uh and i know that some people even when they are looking for when they are trying to make meta-analysis or review papers they even mail each other and ask for any unpublished null results they have and it's like very hard to obtain, but they're very, very, very valuable for people who are doing this kind of work. So publishing them somewhere and storing them somewhere might be very useful just for scientific community and just, you know, serving scientific community and yourself if you ever try to perform meta-analysis might be a good incentive. Right, that's an interesting proposition, right? So then perhaps researchers would even flood into Research Hub in search of uh, the the body of literature not affected by the you know the publication bias by the do uh, desk drawer problem. That's an interesting idea. Uh, just to add to the publishing uh, comment earlier, I I believe it after the after the introduction of the peer review system, there will be a DOI assigned, 100%, there will be a DOI assigned to the papers you publish, which I believe is a reference through Crossref. So it will be included in, you, you know, can be found through Google Scholar and other citation uh, managers and such. All right, so let's move on through the process. So, okay, so we will need a time where people assign reviewers to the to, to the reviewed paper, as, as we discussed, perhaps by the editors who will somehow find those reviewers and perhaps uh, recruit them as a more uh, active users to be utilized in the future. So perhaps that stage will need to be hammered out in the future. So after this, after they make up their decision, which could come up, come down to the binary approve, reject, or maybe something more refined, you know, approve with minor revisions, major revisions, similar to how they do in papers. And after which, what happens? Do you think the paper has, hasn't been uh, approved by the reviewers? Does it go back unpublished? Does it stay on the website with a tag that it's, you know, not, not, approved quality or something like that. What are your thoughts? I think it should stay on the website with uh, with a tag that says that uh, this has not been approved by the editorial or peer review team of RX. Ricardo, you were saying something. I think yeah, yeah, we, can, we could have two, two sections. 
one with like the papers that have been approved and the other one with the other papers. So, so if someone wants to take a look into the other ones that were not approved, you know, uh, he can still do it. That makes sense. Yeah. So in general, I, I agree. I like the sentiment that more more data or more contact, uh, content is better, especially if you can filter it efficiently. That perhaps is a good uh, time to discuss one of the uh, discussion points provided about the one of the decisions we have to make whether it will be a discrete moment of time the, for the review after which it is rejected or approved or would we want it to be more of the innovative uh, living paper type of thing where people can continuously update maybe perhaps conduct multiple rounds of revisions or even if they were originally approved and something has changed and they can update it and it can go through another round of revisions if we if the editors or whoever makes the decision make uh, feasible, thinks it's feasible what do you think do you think we should do a discrete point of time or continuous no i like the idea of having uh like a continuous kind of paper because in that way you can actually like keep it updated and people can continue to contribute even someone that joins the platform for you know for the first time take a look at papers like hey maybe here i can share share some of my experience like a sort of like i tried this protocol this one this one and so on so yeah i really like this idea uh, we want to still keep track of the of the peer review so having like a checkpoints like it has been reviewed then it has been modified and it has been reviewed again and so on yeah, that's a very good point. That's uh, that's what currently is proposed by COVID that we have timestamps and version history, uh, which is an interesting point to consider in terms of anonymity of the offers and the reviewers, right? So how would we have the timestamps? We would perhaps need to specify who reviewed it and then the anonymity is under question. Hmm. Something to consider. Right, uh, Anton. Yeah, it's, it's just for clarification. So, and, and with regards to the peer review, is it like that with the continuous development? It sounds to me like uh, this could go on for like for what kind of time period are we talking? Because when I hear continuous, um, and I might have under misunderstood it, um, but I, it uh, makes me think that uh, it's like going on for one or two years. And I feel like it's probably people just want to get done at some time with something. I don't know how it's done in other sciences, but um, probably yeah, um, it, it, it might be a bit draining even to researchers if it's like for that long time periods. Right. OK, let me clarify. I, I, I perhaps <laughs> skipped an important part. So no, so the original review will still be submitted under the agreed time interval. And that time interval is also up for debates. Perhaps it can be determined individually by the editor who is facilitating the process upon the agreement between the uh, reviewers and the submitters. But the, with the continuous uh, reviews, what it enables is it basically invites people to, instead of publishing a new article to go back and add to their older article it, it's hard to think of a context where it makes sense right so if you made an update to your study perhaps you would want another article because it's better for your cv but perhaps if you were working on some sort of protocol that you just want people to have access to and, and wanted to be the most updated or perhaps you your contribution of your article is a database that you update every year right so then you would want to uh, introduce some changes here and again and go in through another uh, rounds of revision perhaps it could actually be assigned a new doi so you could list it on your cv as separate en entries but it could be found under you know same file or same page in research hub just for ease of access maybe All right okay malik yeah so um just one follow up on that multiple um, so before that like you know about like if a paper is not accepted and it stays on the site um 
are we gonna like also keep like the comments of the reviewer i assume where like why it was not accepted and maybe like like clearly like state um that this is not an accepted science but it's just some data um that 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 has been submitted is that what i understand is correct well it's up to us to decide but i think i think that sounds more transparent right you know mm -hmm. to have the rejection reason available to everyone who is curious yeah yeah and um as far as like the ongoing review part um um i mean as much as awesome it sounds i think it also will require a lot more like resources on the reviewer part um um and uh, you know and um and as anton mentioned like you know like um it, there is new publications every day uh, you know like we are already i can just speak for myself but hard time like keeping up with literature <laughs> and um you know let alone to go to one another paper again um uh one thing we can though include is i, I um like you know, we already have a nice comment section to discuss what's going on about that paper. And what if the primary author can write a special type of a comment that, hey, by the way, ding, 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 some updates on this. And um, a reviewer can just check that part or so, um, um, so that, you know, it just doesn't become something that we sign up for and then we don't have resources. We have like 10 papers, which there are updates and we don't get back to that, you know, so just something to think about right that's an interesting point so th th that actually makes me think whether if there is a substantial update should a new set of reviewers be recruited for that or the old reviewers should take another look yeah perhaps maybe you are right it, it, it does sound like a lot of effort maybe saved for future times not for the, the for the mvp for the starting product uh, Olga? Yeah, I think also like writing one paper infinitely is not really rewarded in science. We are mm -hmm. evaluated by number of papers, which is maybe not the greatest thing ever, but this is a reality of academic life. So rewriting the same paper again, again, and again, and again, and spending time, money, and resources on that is just not something people will do. I feel like, but I think there is might be uh, like there there might be special cases. So one special case I'm thinking uh, of is like something like database, for example, like stimuli database, right? Or for example, uh, psychometric things when you have to update uh, norms for psychometric things every year. So maybe we can allow people to, yeah, submit some kind of like appendix or like some kind of new information as an addition to be published with the article. Or maybe we can implement like series of article where people can publish several papers in a row so they're like connected somehow and maybe they go to the same reviewers makes sense all right Ioana yes maybe we can do some open guidelines like to give the users and the authors the option either they want to be uh, anonymous or in collaboration because there are various type of papers so maybe we can do a multiple choice mm. okay. okay yeah the flexibility here can be a plus mm -hmm. yes okay. to not scare mm -hmm. anyone yes that sounds good a anton yeah i think i, I really like what uh, olga said with uh like bundling basically papers because i think the cool thing with having like a github repository is like basically why we say we github for research would be that we could always like push updates or something but obviously it is not really realistic or i, I can also feel like it's demotivating even to always work on only one paper and then you put a lot of work in and it's not even that appreciated so um but i think what could be is like a combination of it where you say okay we have like deadlines and i want to publish a paper but it's like a continue like rewarding basically long-term research where people devote 
a fair chunk of their lifetime to a topic. Mm -hmm. And then maybe even like other people could contribute it so that you make like almost like a, a thread that mm -hmm. works towards maybe a goal that could be like set together, bundled together. And then people could put like research coin into that and that it's spread out through this. And then if there's like contribution towards this cause, then it gets a share of it or something like this idea of long term goals and people who maybe like pioneer a field with several papers that it's like still coming together or like awarded in in one thing i don't know right no that makes sense uh yeah if you would if you would like to support not a specific paper but perhaps a, an approach or, or or study series or even a paradigm that could be possible interesting yeah so I, i'm guessing the consensus is that there should be some sort of in between between the discrete and the continuous with uh bundling or minor additions being possible but not being the default mode perhaps okay all right so next step in the process would be so after the approval or rejection both reviewer and the offer will receive rec so that perhaps is your value proposition for people to publish at research hub this is the only place where you get paid for publishing not uh, so any thoughts on the amounts? Should it be some sort of percentage from the upvotes, future upvotes, or should, should the payment to the reviewers be uh, as a function of the payment to the offer, or how do you envision it? All right, Anton? I think this is a very tough question because the value of the coin is so unpredictable. Like, <laughs> um, like probably to some people, they will never believe that it might have any value right now, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then I think this is quite tough. Maybe, maybe, maybe bind it to the, but like binding it to upwards is also dangerous, isn't it? Because it can mm -hmm. like, uh, that's, yeah, doesn't set the value right. Um, I don't. I don't know. I just wanted to throw in that it's it's an mm -hmm. interesting question. Yeah. Olga. Yeah, I think uh, payment and like crypto itself is actually very intimidating for academics. And even though we want to attract younger people, if we want reviewers, we want senior people who will review younger people. So. I feel like the payment may not be as high because right now people are doing it for free. But if it costs some amount of figuring out, uh, you know, having issues with multiple wallets, transactions, whatever, uh, and being very confused, people would, would not do it even for money, I feel like. So I feel like we have to simplify the procedure as much as possible and then talk about actual amount hmm. okay i'm um, perhaps something i don't know so just a conjecture here perhaps something uh similar to the editor program where the equivalent of usd can be offered uh curious to hear uh, actually what do you think is an adequate uh, payment for submitting a uh, average quality paper and then submitting an average quality review to said paper it, it also may uh, depend on the topic and how long paper is, right? And how much labor it is in hours. Okay, that's fair. Malik? Yeah, one thing, um, I, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, all papers are not equal. So some will require more hours and others less. But um, and maybe and I'm just throwing it out there, like based on the number of pages or something. Um, uh, but the other thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, we cannot like keep it on a scale where if the paper becomes, I don't know, super famous or something, then the reviewer gets more uh, we cannot keep it that way mainly because um you know we are still on web and um 
there is a potential for misuse where I don't know, like I, I want my paper to go up and I would have like 20 friends just go and look at it and up click it or something. And, um, you know, like, you know, somebody else who is like the reviewer, so they get it and it, it could like end up in a, we can end up in a bad cycle, um, you know, because we are on the web and there is a potential for that um, to happen. So uh, I believe some sort of fixed amount, but like based on the work, like a little bit more or a little bit less, that's understandable, but um, definitely not based on the upvotes that I, I feel at least uh, just because of, mm -hmm. of possible concern. Yeah. Uh, Satik, you had a hand too, right? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask everyone if we had any ideas for what constitutes a bad paper. Kind of what Malik touched on already. Uh, so, uh, a bad or right. even an average paper. Uh, do we have any uh, any sort of guidelines for that in place already or anything in mind? Yeah, definitely not... Uh in the level of detail that we would need it for an actual peer review, right? Especially because of different fields in, like I have no idea how papers in uh, cryptocurrency are reviewed. What would they even pay attention to? And, you know, people in in psychology might, might review things very differently and expect things to be done differently. So perhaps it should be better left to editors of individual hubs, but then at the same time, writing those guidelines is a lot of work N not sure that everyone has uh, an expertise required to do it right because not, not because you don't have you know scientific expertise but because it probably requires specific experience being an editor somewhere else if you want to write that down hmm. mm, there are some examples about ethical guidelines for peer review and for example a paper could be, or, or the part of a paper could be considered bad when uh, information is not correct and the author can replace with the correct information. Well, yeah, that's true. But some cases are, there are a lot of judgment calls, especially when you go into statistical analysis, there are so many things that can be done. Like nobody knows how to do it right, but like it's not that nobody knows but there are so many ways to do it right and uh, opinions may vary and one of them more maybe more accurate than another but we might not know about it yes maybe yeah we we can ask like the editors of the hubs for example how they would classify how what what makes a paper good or bad and also, uh, after the review, we can write like it was reviewed by the author or yes, if the author wants to uh, give his identity or hers identity. Right, yeah, so th that is an interesting issue with the uh, anonymity again, right? So in, in some steps of the submission, it would be nice to not have anonymity, but in some other stages, it would be nice to have it. Yes. Hey, Malik? Yeah, one more point to add, like, so, like, if for, like, a good or a bad paper, and I think uh, the editors um, for their particular branch can, you know, based on their experience or other journals that they review, they can write like a like a tentative guideline um, that would help the reviewers. And like the way I became a peer reviewer um, was um, <clears throat> I was assigned with a mentor for a year. And um, basically I reviewed the article, I sent my comments and he, um, you know, reviewed it and told me, okay, you know, this is what it's unimportant that you're looking into this is what important. And maybe if people want to become reviewers, the editors can coach them um, initially. Um, and like after like, I don't know, like we can come up with something like a dozen or a couple dozen articles they have reviewed. And you're like, OK, you're free to fly and, uh, you know, you can go ahead with it. So some sort of a combination of both guidelines and coaching, I think, would help people. Um, and we can onboard younger reviewers, too, that way.
Yeah, I like this idea. The, the mentoring process needs to be strong if you want to scale it up. Okay, that's a good suggestion. Right, so we have we have a few other topics to discuss, but before we move on, uh, I would like to ask everyone to share examples of websites where you you are a big fan of how they conduct the peer review process there, and you would like us to learn from them. You can share it here or preferably in the Slack, perhaps in the community channel. And one uh, last question here: Do you think it would be do you think we should try to introduce the the element of competition to the peer reviewing process? So, for example, if, what if we have two? And let's imagine imagine situation: we somehow know that there are two equally good reviewers. Somehow they're clones, and one offers to do the review in a week, another one offers to do it in two weeks. Do we hire the first one and pay them more for urgency, or what do we do? I think that's to uh, that's also a case by case basis, right? So, for example, some authors might want a review immediately. Uh, other authors might be open to reviews a month down the line. So maybe while posting, the author can decide uh, how urgently they want it to be reviewed. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, also, to add to this question, as you're thinking about it, uh, also how many reviews do you think we should have, right? So if if four people express the desire to review the paper too urgently too less urgently should we just keep them going or should we settle for the two fastest ones or what would, should be the number if there is a limit to it right anton um yeah i think to me it sounded a bit uh i don't know uh not aggressive but like <laughs> it sounds like with the competition it sounds a bit like things go very fast and that uh, it gives me kind of the, the the first thoughts that I have is that it might seem a bit uh, rushed in a way that things that the reviews go fast and that it's like kind of like a work to do. And I feel like a lot of review reviewers, uh, especially the people who do it right now, they don't get money um, because they often also do it for the passion and like not passion, but like res responsibility. And I feel like if we put people against each other in terms of timelines, it, doesn't get the best reviews, I guess. Mm. Makes sense. Abdul Baki? Oh, sorry, Olga was next. Sorry, you're next, Abdul Baki. Yeah, I also kind of like want to warn people against uh, rewarding fast reviews because I feel like it creates uh, the opportunity to abuse the system and make a very fast reviews in like large amount and earn money just for the sake of earning money and this is not a great situation to be in got it abdul baki um maybe editors could quickly have a look at the paper and the headings the abstract introduction and the conclusion and then we can have an idea about the paper so is it a really good paper or it's middle class so then we can decide uh, it's urgent one so and share our thoughts with the team and then they can decide yes we need two or three reviewers and then it could be done in a week or something like that so i think uh, having quickly look at the paper we can understand the class of the paper so and then we can decide is urgent or not uh just also clear quick clarification uh sometimes people can't do it in a week because they have another job <laughs> uh, and uh, we should also keep in mind that we are working with academics whose primary job is not making reviews but doing other things so we also probably shouldn't uh, prioritize someone because they are readily just because they're readily available over someone who is like, you know, teaching a semester and they can only look at the paper in three weeks from now. Okay, so what I'm hearing is uh, there, there, we shouldn't actively induce a situation where editors compete with each other for who does it the fastest and uh, perhaps the uh, 
the time period to review should be set. So it shouldn't go below a certain threshold, perhaps to avoid situations where people farm reviews. Uh, so there, there hasn't been any comments about the maximum number of reviews. Do you think uh, there should be a number like no more than three reviews? No paper is you know ambiguous enough for uh, to warrant three independent people to think about it. You know. Bucky. Uh, you you mean Malik, I guess. Wait, say again? Um, I guess you mean Malik. Yeah, I didn't read Oh, it's okay. Uh, Malik. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, I think uh, two to three, and I, I guess we can all decide on that, but two to three is good. And one thing we can throw in there is maybe like a multi-specialty. Like, so if a paper is statistics heavy, then one of the reviewers can be a statistician, a mathematician, or, um, you know, somebody who has in-depth knowledge about these, um, um, you know, these calculations that that are fancier and fancier in papers, uh, um, so that we are also checking for the objectivity of the paper rather than just, um, you know, the, like in my field, like just the biological science. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, yeah. I like this idea. It's kind of like a division of labor among uh, reviewers, right? So one reviewer can be tasked to specifically uh, analyze the strictness of the mathematical analysis in the paper, another one to focus on the background, or something like that. Okay, uh, so we ran a little bit out of time. So, but before we go further, I would like to discuss another topic that. Uh, Patrick suggested that can be an extension of the peer review process with uh, citation managers. So the, if many of you might be using you know, Zotero, Mendeley, and many of you might have extensive collections with uh, comments that you already left for yourself when you were analyzing this paper, perhaps when you were write, writing you know, a review or something like that of your own. And so that presents an interesting opportunity for Research Hub because that's a, that's a content that's already out there. And uh, if we could incentivize people to share this content and uh, with, with others, then we could have a you know, big jump start on the amount of content for reviewing. And uh, additionally, perhaps if we could implement some uh, very simple rating system that you know, for the papers in your or a library that you would like to import to uh, Research Hub, then we would also get, you know, a kind of like a lay of the land in terms of uh, perceived quality of the papers that are uploaded to Research Hub. Thoughts on that matter? Good idea, crazy idea? I think it's a good idea for an extension. Like mm -hmm. as Anton said, there has to be the passion and the knowledge to review that paper and the reviewer to not feel pressured to review. Yes. Okay. Does anyone have a few items in their collection that they can recall right now that they would be willing to share like the notes that you took for yourself that are ready to be shipped and share with the world on the research hub. Do you have, have, do you think you have a lot of entries like that or would it need a little bit of work on your side? Sorry, can you specify what do you mean by entries? Well, so the idea is perhaps if you have a collection of papers for, for yourself, for your own use on, let's say, Zotero, right, in your local collection, perhaps you have annotations for these papers that you took, notes you took when you were reading them before you put them in your library. So would you think you would be comfortable with sharing those notes uh, with Research Hub, if, especially if this process would be, you know, automated and you would get rewarded this RFC for doing so. 
I don't see why not, because this is essentially what we are doing for like commencing under papers, basically. I think it would be cool if we could like maybe choose which one to sh which ones to share and which ones to not, because some of them just make sense only for me and not to other people. Mm. Right. Uh, Anton? I think I have two ideas for this. So mm -hmm. the, the one idea, which is um, at least this is from, from, from the uh, master's degree I currently do. There's lots of like seminars where students actually every semester have to present a paper. So they, 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 they work a whole semester to read the paper thoroughly and um, then they summarize. And I think there's lots of student projects like this actually in uni. And every time I realized they, that it's so frustrating because after they present it maybe to their class, they can't use it anywhere else, these notes. And I think the, the, the risk is that they might get some stuff wrong maybe if they summarize things. But I think it would be also pretty rewarding if they could upload it. Like they basically have the paper of an author and then you have like a section, we talked about it like a student section mm -hmm. where like students could upload like maybe their PDFs or PowerPoints or anything they did on that paper. Because I guess there's some papers where a lot of students actually do stuff in uni. And what I also would find interesting is with the ELN. So like, I think this is more long-term, but if we have like in the future, like some HTML based paper publishing, it would be pretty cool if you could hover over keywords or like topics or sections and like people could like collaboratively like add notes to it, like comments or something. And then there's like upvotes, there's like entire comment sections if you hover above a paper. So you have like a plot or something and you just hover above it with your mouse and then you see like comment section, you can open it like a pop-up thing. And then you see like the most upvoted comment first, like as a thought or idea. And also I think what's cool is like, uh, like deciphering equations. So like students, like when I, I often read like a paper on good notes and then like uh, write on it on the tablet. And then I often have to write like, what is the equation for sometimes when there's like maths. And if you could hover above it and like people could add like, I don't know, clarification. I think it's interesting if we talk the ELN though, because probably in a PDF, it's not as feasible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that uh, interesting, that would kind of like a reverse integration. So you could see back in your citation manager, you could see kind of like the convergence point of notes of many, many people on that particular paper and you could browse through them. Yeah. To be honest, I didn't even think like that. <laughs> I thought of it like uh, untitled, but yeah, I mean, that would be, I don't know if it's possible, but maybe. Mm. Okay, yeah. Interesting. Uh, Satik? Uh, yeah, I think what I had to say has partially been covered by Olga and Anton. Uh, so uh, there can be a lot of noise generated through these notes, like, uh, because everyone has a lot of notes. And while writing, I don't make very coherent notes per se. So how will we make sure that the notes that go on to the website are actually useful for somebody reading the paper? And also, who, how do we envision people actually using these notes uh, in the first place? So I think Anton touched upon that uh, by saying that it can be annotations that, uh, that show up when you hover over the paper. Do we have any other use cases in mind for these notes or will they just be a extra content on the website? That's an interesting point. I, I guess uh, we could do some sort of not verification process, but if if we are to automatically pull so much unfiltered content into Research Hub, perhaps there could be some sort of not tag, but they, they could exist in Research Hub with some sort of indication that those are like automatically pulled comments. So that they might make sense, might not, right? Unless they are maybe verified by some other users as you know meaningful standalone comments, and then they are visible as normal comments. Hmm. Maybe something like a thread. Yes, and people can add ideas about a certain topic, although there's a hypothesis 
feature in Research Hub about this, but I think it's different when we specify that this is a thread and people mm -hmm. can add opinions. Maybe. Right, I kind of like it, right? So it goes back to this idea of low stakes places and research hub where people feel free to just post whatever uh, and it's, it's less moderated and yeah, could be just like brainstorming between students. Fred. Okay, uh, Olga. Yeah, so the service Skillshare, if someone used it at any point in their life. So it's basically educational service where you watch videos of like arts, crafts and whatever, and people teaching you to do something. And they have this like notes kind of thing where you can type your own notes and you can also choose whether you want to see other people notes. And people leave like sometimes uh, time in the particular video, which was like something significant for them and like make notes about it. And you can like exchange them. And I think you can also set up whether you want other people to see your notes or not. So something like this can be also an option. Yeah, that's interesting. So on the research hub itself, you could uh, turn on and off, like view random notes, personal notes or not. Right, so if you're not in the mood for that today. Okay, uh, Anton? Yeah, I to totally agree. I think that's a very cool idea. I think it would be even cooler if you could anonymize it and still get rewards from it. So mm -hmm. basically, I'm not ashamed if I add a stupid comment, but maybe it's a smart comment. And <laughs> I think uh, especially like when reading papers, you don't want to bother with it. When you do actively a comment, you bother more with it or you're okay with not being anonymous. But I guess uh, like automating like anonymized notes on paper could also bring up like big questions that people usually wouldn't be like asking. Mm -hmm. And then people could upvote on them. And then basically you have the option, you imagine you go through a paper and ideally it's directly in research up in HTML or something like on the website. And then you have the option to hover over things and see if people took notes with regards to that section. And then, um, you can maybe sort by latest notes. And that also maybe gives you a feeling of other people are reading this paper right now. So like a real time, like I'm not the only person reading this. Hmm. And then you could also sort it by most upvoted if you're interested what's like the most helpful stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so that would be, you know, a, a big, big, big storage of uh, anonymous anonymous uh, comments. It, it, interesting. And then perhaps if one of the comments is, a hidden gem that's later discovered by someone else maybe it can be elevated to uh, you know the status of a like fully blown comment and maybe perhaps we could request the offer to de-anonymize themselves if we would like to ask more questions you know in in some moderated fashion so that you know no 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 confidentiality is breached just indirectly and requested upon consent Okay, Malik, we, we are over time a little bit and definitely we're not going to have time to talk about the newsletter and Twitter So for next time. So let's finish with a few last questions we have and wrap it up for today. Malik? Or maybe Satvik, if Malik is not here? Yeah. Uh, so regarding this, I really like the idea of treating it as a genius for papers, right? Uh, and on genius, you can see that the most highlighted comment will be from the songwriter himself. So in this case, it can be the author himself who who says that uh, this is who highlights some part and tries to maybe provide more justification or more reasoning for it that they couldn't include in the original paper, for example, right? Uh, and then the way Genius goes about uh, its annotations overall is that some editor will uh, write the first part and then there will be contributions that will be rewarded uh, by, for them it's IQ points for us, it would be research coin. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. So the contributions will be rewarded as per uh, every time they're accepted by the original editor. 
right so it will be heavy on the editors but uh, i think it will reduce a lot of the noise while still while still keeping it sort of democratic uh, right. or oh, yeah making it easy for people to contribute without without making it an overload on the readers yeah, that's an interesting solution right and then there's this edit history where you can just click and see all of the edits that were made if you're interested right so that can be one way to go about it yeah thank you all right malik go ahead yeah i i just had a questions about this uh one quick question so like when you say like is somebody ready to share it like somebody has read 10 papers like are they like i'm just giving an example like are they all going to be like open access um, that they'll upload or not necessarily you mean from their collection in the situation yeah. uh, i'm guessing similar pipeline as it is now if it's open access it's going to be uploaded uh, all together if it's not open access only the abstract Would that work? okay yeah okay thanks for explaining and and other question i had was so um uh, like right now when we signed up as editors like you know patrick told that you know you're like kind of responsible as editor for like any comments that are not like you know like not not specific enough and stuff um so if if let's say 15 articles are uploaded in i don't know dermatology section like and there are these comments like is that the same like expectation from the editors to check it or not i'm just asking i, I don't know so right uh, I'm, I'm guessing it will have to figure out an alternative <clears throat> solution and uh, perhaps one of the ones that we have discussed today but i'm guessing probably especially if we import and mass comments that are not necessarily high quality and there is a it will be a big number of them we will need to figure out the some sort of sorting solution where the editors don't review every single one of the hundreds and hundreds of comments but get to the you know top meaningful ones and review them but yeah you'll have to figure something out yeah and sorry one last question <laughs> um are these comments going to be like the same way below the paper as it's seeing now or these are going to be a little bit different right well several people propose different ways it could be it could be kind of like a giant thread it could be similar to it could be just posted in inline uh comments i guess if we have the open access uh text of the paper we'll have yeah. to decide we don't know yet okay okay thanks i just was confused so i want to make sure yeah thanks all right and we are out of time unless someone has any final remarks no then this meeting is concluded thank you everyone for coming thank you for in invaluable feedback thank you thank you bye-bye everyone